Welcome to CBC Windsor News at 6. I'm Meg Roberts. Thanks so much for spending part of your evening with us tonight. The Chatham Kent man wants you to check your homes for radon gas. That's after finding alarming levels in his newly purchased home. Plus, we bring you the details on a program that will require some local landlords to get a license. That's after a court challenge failed. And we share with you a story tonight of a World War II airman who died in a tragic crash decades later. We speak with his Windsor relative. A man in Chatham, Kent, wants you to be vigilant about testing for radon gas. That's after discovering alarming amounts in his home last fall. Hold it up. Every morning, Bob Barnes wakes up and checks the reading on his radon gas monitor. The top one is your long term. If it wasn't for an encounter with a neighbor last summer, Barnes would have never known his newly purchased house also came with extremely high levels of a cancer-causing gas. We had no idea. And he says, well, I have a meter. He says, um, you're welcome to use it. So he did. The reading in his living room, 2,500 Baccarels per cubic meter. Health Canada recommends nothing over 200. I thought maybe the meter was not reading correctly, so I reset it. Again, it was around the 25, 2600. The reading in his basement, more than 40 times what the government says are healthy limits. I opened up every window, every door. Radon is an odorless, invisible, radioactive gas released naturally from the ground. It can enter homes through floor drains or cracks in the foundation. And data shows it's the second leading cause of lung cancer deaths after cigarettes. What happens is, is when we, um, we breathe in radon at sufficient levels and for long enough, the radiation damages the DNA of our lungs and that leads to genetic mutations. The gas can be found in any home that has contact with the ground. However, Gadarzi says rural communities have a 30% increased risk of higher levels and newer built homes have a one in four chance of high radon levels which is worse than older homes. Come on down, careful. The cough and headache Barnes developed during the fall of last year has cleared up since fixing his radon issues. The handyman drilled a hole into the basement floor and stuck a pipe over top with a fan to blow the gas out. But Barnes wonders how he was able to purchase the house with no mention of it, despite government knowing the risks. They don't inform you, they don't uh, test or make you test, they don't give you any indication of its severity. They don't tell you that it's, you know, a major problem in this area or they, uh, you know, any other areas. So you're kind of on your own. There are two reasons for this, says Gadarzi. Radon causing cancer wasn't unequivocally proven until the mid-2000s, and radon gas falls under provincial jurisdiction. So it's under each Canadian province or territory is or isn't, in, in many cases, doing their own thing. And that's sort of created um, a lack of um, critical momentum. The provincial government said in a statement that local public health authorities are responsible for raising public awareness and supporting the development of health policies around health hazards in indoor air and exposure to radiation. There have been efforts to combat radon locally. In 2015, the health unit undertook a three-year study it found approximately 11% of homes tested across the city and county have radon levels above healthy levels and have had a number of public health campaigns since. The fan itself outside. But Barnes says there's a lot of people who aren't aware and he wonders what could have happened if his neighbor didn't stop by. It's not just your health, but anybody who lives with you. If you have your grandkids over, and we do, and you're not going to put their lives and, and health at risk. So get it checked. A big development in a court battle between landlords and the city of Windsor. At issue, a program that requires some local landlords to get a license in order to rent out units. The Ontario Superior Court has dismissed a push to kill the program, a win for the city. The CBC's Chris Ensing joins me now. Chris, why have landlords been fighting this program uh, in the court? Well, Meg, the big part of all of this is the money, the costs that are associated with this for landlords. And they say that because of how much those fees are, they're going to pass it on to renters, or the fees will be so high that it will prevent people from building rental units. 
Now, this program requires people renting out properties with four units or less to get a license for that rental. And it only applies to landlords in Wards 1 and Wards 2. That's the West End and most of South Windsor. The license itself costs $466, needs to be renewed each year. That's with the city. To get the license, a landlord needs a criminal record check and an electrical safety assessment. That, combined, is another $400. Windsor launched the program last year. A group of landlords, hundreds of them, combined together to put a court challenge forward. They've called the program illegal, discriminatory, and approved in bad faith. This week, a justice dismissing those claims. That clears a path for the city to continue with the two-year pilot program. The head of the group challenging this program says that they're still considering all of their legal options. That could include an appeal of the decision. Boris Zazanski told me that he's been a landlord for years, wants to provide better housing than what he lived in when he was a student here. He now splits his time between Toronto and Windsor. He takes issue with the licenses that are now required for new builds, which he says get inspected during the permit and construction process. It, it, the whole idea is to create that extra stock. When you run the numbers, for example, if somebody has an accessory dwelling unit, they say they rent for twelve hundred dollars. We just take one month's rent away. The yeah. property might only make the property might only make three thousand dollars. You're taking as a percentage, you're taking forty percent of of the profit that the owner is trying to make to recover some of the cost of developing that property. You're taking forty percent of that or thirty percent of that in terms of a fee, which doesn't make the property any safer. So what have you accomplished? It's it's mind boggling. Chris, why does City Council want landlords to be registered? This goes back years and years, and it has to do with safety. Essentially, what they're saying is that if they can do this, it will keep property standards up to code. The most recent push for this program, led by Fabio Costante, Ward 2 Councillor. He says it makes sure that properties on the rental market meet standards and prevents renters from being taken advantage of. He's happy with this decision and fully supports the program. Uh, this has been a long time coming. It's something that has been uh, a top issue here on the west side, uh, but I'll say in the last five years or so, it has spread quite significantly throughout our city in light of the housing crisis and in light of how many people have been moving to our city in the last few years. So now you're seeing a lot of these challenges in South Windsor, you're seeing them in, in pockets in our core and in pockets on, uh, on the east side as well. Now, the councillor says that 700 landlords, ab about that number, signed up for licenses before the court challenge put a big pause on the signups. A third didn't pass their first inspection. Now, talking with bylaw enforcement today, they say that some places are failing those inspections because of window screens or fire alarm changes, while others have had their inspection fail because they've created rooms that are not up to code. Now, as for the argument that costs are being passed on to renters, Costante says that that isn't accurate. However, the landlord group, they cite a specific case where the costs were passed on to a renter in Waterloo after that city passed a similar bylaw. Now, the landlord group is going to look at their legal options. The city has an enforcement tool to act on and that they're going to be doing a midpoint update on this program as well. Again, a two-year pilot program. We'll get more details about that in front of council later. Thanks so much for that, Chris. That's the CBC's Chris Ensing. Tonight, the story of a Second World War airman who died in a tragic crash in the United Kingdom. This summer will be the 80th anniversary and families on both sides of the Atlantic will be coming together for a service, including relatives right here in Windsor. The BBC's Steve Nibbs has the story. This picture here was up on my grandma's setup where she has all the pictures and I would constantly ask questions. In Windsor, Ontario, Ed Stortz is now the custodian of his great uncle's military possessions. He had a, a journal with, with pictures and any magazine that he was able to read. From a young age, Flying Officer John Glenn was fascinated with military aviation. He joined the Royal Canadian Air Force very early in the war, uh, spent a lot of time in Canada training, got attached to a Royal Air Force Halifax bomber uh, and was a tail gunner. But in August 1944, John Glenn lost his life, returning from a mission. They were laying mines in the English Channel, but on the way back there was some sort of malfunction and they were flying too low and they crashed into Cleve Common. A memorial now sits in the place near to where the Halifax came down at Cheltenham in England. The crash killed John Glenn and six other aircrew. And this summer, the families of those who died here will gather at the spot to remember their sacrifice. And Ed and his family will be there. It's a moment my dad has really talked about a lot because growing up, he was so close 
to his age, actually. So I believe this is going to be a big moment for my dad to uh, to see where this all happened. 15th of July, that's quite an important day. That's the wedding day. Over three and a half thousand miles away in Blenavon in Wales, Pauline Fieldhouse shows me a diary. It would have been St Peter's Church, which is a photograph. Her mother's first husband was Sergeant Emmanuel Harris. Married today, 12.45, Blenavon. But just over a month later, she had to write a heartbreaking entry in her husband's diary. My mother's writing, Manny got killed on August the 26th. Oh, it's very, very sad and so young a life. And this is where Pauline shares a connection with Ed in Canada. Emmanuel was one of the air crew aboard the Halifax bomber. He's buried in the town and his name is on the war memorial. He'll be remembered along with the other air crew at the ceremony this summer. And Pauline will be there to join Ed's and the other families as they all come together. I just think it's my duty with following on from my mother. When I've sent to people in the Legion and they are really interested in it, they've said could they come along as well and put a reef down from the Blenavon branch. So 80 years on, the Halifax crew will be remembered by their descendants and a new generation. A reminder that so many stories of loss and sacrifice during war are still to be told. For CBC News, I'm Steve Nibbs. A wild ride for one truck driver on Highway 3 today, as well as one turkey. The OPP say a wild turkey smashed through the front window of this semi-truck in Kingsville. You can see the entire passenger side of the windshield is pushed in. Here is the turkey that survived the crash. The OPP say no injuries were reported from the driver of the uh, truck or the wild turkey that smashed through it. What is Windsor's worst road? CAA has launched its annual campaign to find the answer to that question. They want your input. You can vote on its website until April 19th. They say the purpose of this campaign is to highlight bad roads to government and push for more infrastructure funding. CAA says a survey found it costs drivers an average of $852 to fix a vehicle damaged by a pothole. Last year's results showed some of the worst roads in Windsor were Lozon Parkway, Tecumseh Road East and University Avenue West. A Chatham-Kent woman has been charged after police say she broke into a house and was found cooking in the kitchen. The 24-year-old faces charges of break and enter and theft. It happened around 9 a.m. yesterday at a home on Queen Street in Chatham. Police say the homeowner was alerted by a smoke alarm, which was prompted by the food the accused was making. It's unclear how she got into the home. After the homeowner called 911, the woman fled the home but was taken into custody nearby. Colette, our temperatures have been so up and down for the past, well, really the entire winter. I'm having a hard time keeping up with seasonal temperatures. Is this weather what we experience today, is that normal for this time of year? Yeah, no, now today our temperatures were on the cool side, about five degrees below where they should be in terms of the afternoon temperature anyway. So I know it is uh, spring and fall. They are always these roller coaster rides of up and down. And uh, here we are and all we can do is kind of buckle up. So let's go ahead and show you what's going on temperature wise. I did stand here last night, I'll be honest, if those who didn't see uh, the show yesterday and I said uh, high for tomorrow of seven degrees but I'm not sure on this one because it's going to be tricky well we did hit seven degrees today but that was in the wee morning hours so I mean technically that's a check <laughs> but it didn't really work for the afternoon uh, where the temperature you can see currently just four degrees and the warmer air look at this Ottawa Montreal double digits there I'll show you why in a moment you can probably guess and and then that much colder air closer to the center of the low that is uh, kind of stuck there over northern Ontario still churning uh, some areas with snowfall it's rain for the eastern seaboard and we're kind of in between so that's why we've had some of the cloud cover but we're actually going to be moving into a nicer pocket with this pattern because a ridge of high pressure off of Newfoundland is kind of blocking everything else and holding up that low and kind of keeping us sort of on the good side of things. So another look at the current temperatures and filling in with Sarnia and Chatham Kent. Uh, you can see those readings there, three degrees. Yes, yeah, so a westerly breeze, gusty at times. Now we're gonna find these winds 
kind of easing through the overnight. This is pretty typical. But then tomorrow, they'll start off relatively weak, but then we get into a stronger westerly flow kind of about midday, say, as we get towards late morning and then through into the afternoon. And these are just the sustained winds. Sustained winds around 30 kilometers an hour, but then we'll have gusts around 40 to 50 kilometers an hour. So a little breezy uh, through midday tomorrow. The satellite imagery kind of showing you, yes, that cloud deck hanging in there. And I said I'd give you a clue, and there it is. <laughs> Look at that slice right there uh, where there was more sunshine. It kind of started uh, near the GTA and then just moved into eastern Ontario, and that sun helped pick those temperatures up. So uh, a few flurries north, that, that carries on. Otherwise, what we are getting into here is a pattern of seeing some nice clearing overnight tonight, which is a great setup for Thursday because it means we get into some sunshine and we see those temperatures not only on the seasonal side, but actually a little bit above. But just taking you through the evening hours, overnight zero, and then by tomorrow morning, we kind of bottom out there at minus one with a bit of a wind chill, but then up to 10 degrees for the high tomorrow afternoon. We're back to double digits, sunshine into Friday. Just watch out as we head into the holiday weekend, both Saturday and even Monday. I do have a chance of showers in there, Meg. Okay, we'll talk a little bit more tomorrow about that Easter weather forecast. Thanks so much, Colette. Looking forward to it. Exceptional strength of character, deep commitment to service, and the potential to lead with integrity. Those are the guidelines for a $100,000 Lawrence Scholars Foundation Student Award. This year, a Windsor student is being honored for teaching in a refugee camp in Malaysia before arriving in Canada. She spoke with Windsor Morning earlier today. I'm an Afghan woman, um, and especially right now in Afghanistan, women and girls are not allowed to go to schools to go to work, even get outside of their homes. And I'm also a first generation student. Um, I was a refugee once in Malaysia. I'm a newcomer here and um, I am someone who uh, dreams big. So h hearing, the, hearing the news really made me grateful and feeling blessed. Last summer, we told you about an interesting piece of art and tomorrow you could get a chance to hear directly from the artist. Catherine Hurd will be giving a public talk at the university, telling the story of a quilt that involves over 250 artists. The quilt weaves together important and difficult historical events. It uses a technique called red work embroidery. We swung by to take a look. This is a piece that I hope people can appreciate on many levels. It is a work that highlights craftsmanship both by historical embroiderers and by contemporary participants. But it's also a piece that has the potential to disturb us and make us think. And it also is a piece that's about storytelling. I hope that while the piece is up in Windsor, people will come see the work and give it time. I'm not sure the piece will ever be done at this point. I don't have an end date in mind. It will continue to be exhibited. And every summer, I will be sitting down with my assistants to assemble the embroideries that have come in throughout the year. And they will become part of the piece at subsequent exhibitions. Coming up, we head to Queen's Park, where there's an argument happening between the provincial and federal government over supportive housing. Stay tuned.
tiff continues between the federal and provincial governments over money for supportive housing. The feds say that Ontario isn't living up to its commitment, but Ontario's housing minister sees the issue differently. Queen's Park reporter Lorenda Redekop explains. The federal Liberals say they won't hand over more than $350 million if the province won't build more affordable housing. The federal housing minister says Ontario has reached just 6% of its commitment, while other provinces have reached around two-thirds of theirs. The minister adds that the province then updated its plan to 28%. I don't think it's responsible for me to transfer funding uh, for the purpose of home building for homes that are never going to be built. Uh, we are going to work to find a way to make sure that the money that we have budgeted for affordable housing in Ontario helps build affordable housing in Ontario. This follows a flurry of letters. The federal minister warning the province it may have to withhold the money. The province writing back saying that's unacceptable, threatening the most vulnerable, and that Ontario's situation is different with older housing stock and a huge repair backlog, and that here it's municipalities who deal directly with affordable housing. Now the Association of Municipalities of Ontario has also written a letter to the federal minister saying municipalities will suffer. We remain uh, willing to uh, be at the table, but our position is not going to change. I'm not going to change laws. I'm not going to change decades worth of how we provide this type of housing. They knew that this was how we delivered housing when the agreement was signed with the previous Liberal government in 2018, so this is not a surprise. The provincial Liberals are holding the province to the same standard the Ford government has for municipalities, only rewarding ones that meet their housing target. Have a plan. Meet your targets and we'll give you money. It's exactly the same thing Paul Calandra is saying. And he doesn't want to live by his own rules. We are so far behind. We are letting Ontarians down. And so the government needs to go to the federal government and say, uh, what can we do to access this money? We need it. Absolutely we need it. But we have to have a plan in place. Neither side in this federal provincial fight backing down. If there is not a clear path for the government of Ontario to satisfy the entirety of the commitment that they had agreed to with eyes wide open, then they should not expect to receive the full amount of money. The federal minister says over the next few days, he'll be assessing Ontario's latest plan as that April 1st deadline is looming. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. We have an update on the bridge that collapsed in Baltimore yesterday. That's coming up.
U.S. federal safety investigators are now examining the Voyage data recorder from the container ship that crashed into a Baltimore bridge yesterday. The head of the NTSB spoke today about immediate priorities. It's getting this perishable evidence that we need, uh, the components, the electronic logs, any sort of paperwork, the pictures we need to take, uh, anything we need to identify to take uh, from the bridge structure itself. Recovery efforts resumed this morning for six construction workers who were on the Francis Scott Key Bridge when it collapsed early in the morning. They are presumed dead. The ship lost power and issued a distress call moments before it hit, but it was moving too fast to change course. The bridge is a major commuter and commercial transport link, and the Port of Baltimore is critical to North America's supply chain. U.S. President Joe Biden has vowed to rebuild the bridge with federal funds. Chocolate is a staple Easter food, but not so much if you're a bear. Instead, fruit and nuts covered in flour and water are more preferred. These boys went searching for the savory Easter egg treats at a zoo today. It was one of many activities zookeepers have introduced to keep the bears busy. Some of the bears' neighbors, monkeys and mongoose, weren't quite as lucky. They had to settle for regular chicken eggs, though they were painted in a variety of fun colors. Well, that's it for CBC Windsor News. Don't forget, for news anytime, you can go to our website at cbc.ca slash Windsor. You can also download the CBC News app for stories that matter most to you. And don't forget to watch The National tonight at 9 on CBC News Network, 10 p.m. on the CBC News app, CBC TV and streaming on CBC Gem and CBC Explore. Thanks so much for tuning in. Looking forward to seeing you back here tomorrow night.